Today, I have the honour of introducing you to Professor Geraldine Doyle, and she's full Professor of Accounting at the UCD College of Business and currently Visiting Scholar at Harvard Business School. Geraldine has recently completed a five-year term as Associate Dean of the UCD College of Business and Director of the Michael Smurfett Business School. I will speak to her about her wide-ranging transdisciplinary work across healthcare. So, a huge welcome to the series, Geraldine. Thank you so much, Patricia, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and delighted to be tuning in from the fabulous Harvard Business School. And we're delighted to have you too, Geraldine. And first question for you today, Geraldine, is your work is so wide ranging and so interdisciplinary. Maybe you give our audience a snapshot of your career to date. Well, I began my career um, just after my 17th birthday. Um, I uh, started in UCD uh, to study my Bachelor of Science degree, specifically to major in pharmacology and minor in physiology. On graduating, I then trained with chartered uh, accountancy firm KPMG uh, as a chartered accountant and a chartered tax advisor. So on returning to UCD as a faculty member and to the College of Business, um, in thinking about my PhD study and what might be the unique contribution I might make, I thought that bringing the disciplines of medicine and accounting would be very unique and indeed could be my unique intellectual signature. So so that actually led because of the amount of EU funding that is devoted to so many health projects and um, tackling many of our global health problems. Um, I was invited to be principal investigator for a wide range of EU funded large comparative studies. And that has led to such an exciting and wonderful career as a researcher and, um, and also collaborating with colleagues from multiple disciplines, um, not only international nationally and co-authoring internationally, but also indeed within UCD. So I've worked with colleagues across um, many of our colleges and uh, schools within UCD from medicine, nursing, um, our Food Institute, uh, sociology, uh, UCD Insight, and of course, the Conway Institute as well. So I'm sure our audience will have many questions around that, but it, your, your research really is fundamentally built around societal impact. And, and maybe you could give you know, you've whet our appetites, maybe you could give our audience a quick summary of the research that you have underway at the moment. Certainly. Um, so I suppose my research really focuses on the person and the patient and putting the patient and the person as our unit of analysis. Um, and in that context, collecting real world data. So we go into healthcare organizations, we collect real world data uh, to understand how can we possibly maximize and optimize the health outcomes of our patients. Um, and, um, and then in that way, having societal impact. So my research focuses on measurement and measurement in healthcare two specific areas, measurement of health literacy, and then secondly, measurement of value that is delivered by our health services. Um, so maybe just tell you a little bit about health literacy, first of all. So health literacy is really about empowerment. It's about empowering the individual to have the skill set and the competencies to able to access, understand, appraise and apply health information to manage their own health and the health of their loved ones. Um, so I've been involved in the study of health literacy for over 15 years now, and um, it began with the very first European study on health literacy. Um, and um, in that regard, we had eight countries included in the study. We've since completed a second uh, data collection 10 years later where we had 17 countries we now have 28 countries who are part of that study um, and now um, the WHO um, are proposing to use our unique um, instrument for measuring health literacy as part of a global study so that we can have comparative data uh, across countries globally and um, so that gives you a little bit of insight into uh, it in insight and and um, I suppose my next question is around the health literacy around um, and, and value based healthcare around cystic fibrosis, because I know that was your first. So this is your second time as a visiting scholar to, to Harvard Business School. But the first time you were there, you started a big study around um, uh, around um, cystic fibrosis. So maybe maybe you could tell our, our audience about that. 
Yes, when I was here in 2017, I, I was here for one semester, and it was actually over an informal coffee uh, with, um, with some colleagues in uh, Harvard Business School and also in Boston Children's Hospital that we discovered that we had a common interest uh, in cystic fibrosis. Um, as we know, uh, cystic fibrosis um, is, is, is carried within our genes. Uh, there's a huge population, Irish population in Boston. So we thought this would be a wonderful study to do a comparative study transatlantic between Boston Children's Hospital and Children's Health Ireland. Um, so we brought together um, Harvard Business School, uh, UCD College of Business, Boston Children's Hospital and Temple Street hospital um, and what we did was uh, we um we mapped out the process of care to understand um, are there differences in the process of care in Boston and Ireland? And are there things that Boston can learn from Ireland and vice versa that Ireland can learn from Boston? And sure enough, we did. We found that, um, in fact, when we delved into the detail of the process of care, we found that for some categories of children that it was much cheaper. So we had a much lower cost of care in Ireland. However, um, we spent more time with our patients. So when we got into the detail, we discovered that in Boston, the most expensive healthcare professional was working with the patients, but for a much shorter space of time. So the most senior physician was working with the children, uh, but for a much shorter time. Whereas in Ireland, we used our specialist nurse. So we have CF specialist nurse in Ireland um, and they spent a much longer time with the patient. So even though we were a lower cost, we were spending much longer time with the patient. And obviously for children and for parents, that's reassuring in terms of their journey and their experience. Experience. We also found another difference. We have a specialist CF pharmacist as part of our multidisciplinary team in Temple Street and in Children's Health Ireland, whereas they don't have such an expert uh, pharmacist in Boston Children's Hospital. And as you know, Patricia, there's been a huge um, advance in terms of pharmacotherapies and the modulator therapies that are now transforming the lives of children with cystic fibrosis. And um, they're having much better lung function, much lower lower levels of um, exacerbations and day to day they're feeling much better um, and, uh, and, and parents are saying that their children's lives are being transformed. So having that specialist CF pharmacist as part of the Irish team is really valuable because they're the ones who are at the cutting edge of these new therapies. And is that something that then translated over to Boston afterwards? Um, well, we're, um, we have been uh, presenting our research this summer and we're just finalizing our uh, research paper for, um, for publication. So uh, we haven't seen that yet, but perhaps we will in the future. Oh, that's so interesting. And I'm sure uh, I'm sure our audience will have so many questions around that because that's just it's, it's wonderful. Normally, we're always learning from elsewhere and it's wonderful to see um, healthcare providers learning from what we do here. It's that's phenomenal. So. Uh, I will. I will open up the the questions. We've so we've a lot of questions coming in. I'm um um they're coming in on my screen here, but uh it's uh it's actually um a, a question I wanted to ask you, uh, in terms of and it's one question that's actually come in um uh, from the audience is what are you doing right now in in Harvard Business School? What's the research that's underway on your on your second sabbatical over there now? Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So at uh, my first time, I was being hosted by the most eminent and most gracious professor of accounting, uh, Professor Kaplan. And one of his protégés was Professor uh, Susanna Galani. Uh, so while I was here in 2017, Susanna and I got to know each other. And um, and then, you know, in discussions um, and, and, you know, during and post the pandemic, the issue of healthcare provider burnout um, and also uh, people leaving the profession. So people um, are leaving, um, uh, doctors and also nurses are leaving the profession uh, to go into other areas, for example, many going into consulting. Um, and um, so we thought that it would be really interesting to try to understand the reasons and the causes for the feeling of burnout um, and, and people leave, leaving the profession. So high turnover is exper being experienced on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, fatigue, burnout. So we really want to understand what are the root causes? Because heretofore, there's a sense that, um, well, yes, we see the symptoms of burnout, high turnover, people leaving the profession. But what are actually the root causes? So let's get to the root causes and treat those root causes and address them rather than the symptoms um, of burnout. So we're drawing upon 
on um, uh, Robert Simon's framework uh, of job design. Um, in addition to uh, Christina Maslock uh, has a an instrument to measure burnout. So we're bringing these two uh, frameworks together, which is quite unique, uh, to order in order to um, I suppose disentangle and understand the root causes. And most importantly, are there any managerial interventions that can be made to uh, reduce and to mitigate that feeling of burnout? Um, healthcare pro is provided by teams, um, multidisciplinary teams. So the role of teams, we also want to understand what's the role of teams and teaming in particular, and that feeling of psychological safety within teams. How does that impact um, on burnout as well? So, so that's what I'm uh, specifically working on at the moment. Now, this is fascinating. I can't wait to see the outcomes of that, Jordan. It just sounds incredible. I, I, I wish you already knew what the answers were, but I, I will, we leave you time to do the research and enjoy beautiful Boston. But there's so many questions coming in around your work in childhood obesity. So, so and like you're you're so I mean it's incredible. You you've such societal impact with your with your research. But maybe tell us about your your childhood obesity research. Well, this merges really from the uh, the global pandemic that is childhood obesity, um, and um, we have seen the trends and the statistics um, over a number of years. Uh, we see that um, uh, the Global Obesity Observatory um, are predicting that by 2030, uh, that 18% of girls and 20% of boys will um, have um, obesity or overweight. Um, and in this context, um, this particular study on childhood obesity um, was a Horizon 2020 study. Um, our coordinators were uh, colleagues in the uh, Uni Thessalonica uh, University in Greece, um, the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, and also then us at uh, here in UCD for representing Ireland. Uh, within this study, we engaged schools. Uh, so we worked with school teachers um, in order to collect data from children. Um, we also worked with policymakers um, in each of the countries as well, in addition to um, another three countries to understand what are the priority areas um, in which we can address um, this issue of childhood obesity. Um, and what was revealed from that study was that um, the built environment was really important. So the opportunities that children have going to and from school uh, to buy um, foods that are um, high density um, and, and high, highly calorific. Um, but what was really unique about this study was we worked with industry, we worked with Cosmotes, uh, which was a telecoms company in Greece, and we co-designed and co-developed an app that children and adolescents could use and from which we could collect data. Um, so children recorded, for example, um, how much physical activity they were doing, how much time they were spending on screen and on their computers playing games, um, and also um, they up loaded photographs um, of their meals. So we had more than uh, 5,500 children um, engaging with the app. Uh, they submitted more than 100,000 photographs of the foods they were eating. Um, and we had, um, we also collected data on their mood, how they were feeling to understand was the relationship between um, how they were feeling. Um, so we had more than 30,000 um, questionnaires um, on food. Um, so the GPS component um, of the app was really important as well because it gave us a bird's eye view in terms of the proximity of those schools to fast food, uh, to opportunities for, for, for children to buy unhealthy food. Um, and that really calls upon uh, the role of policymakers uh, in terms of um, a planning permission. So should planning permission be granted uh, to um, businesses uh, to sell such foods in close proximity to children? It also gave us a bird's eye view around schools um, where children could um, uh, go to green spaces, uh, play games, play sports and, and, and just have fun in the outdoors. Instead of going through the shops and buying something really high in sugar and it leads me on to policy and, and sugar taxes. So I'm sorry, there's so many questions coming in, Georgine, so I'm just trying to keep you. So I might ask you to keep your answers a bit short on this so we can kind of get through as many as possible. But the sugar tax, the Irish sugar tax, because I know that's directly come from work that you've been doing, Irish sugar tax. Any any difference? Has this made a difference? It came in in 2018. Yes, indeed. So um, the tax was introduced and the way that the tax was designed by our government was to impose the tax on the manufacturers of sugary drinks in Ireland or indeed on um, the first 
port of um, importing such sugary drinks into Ireland. Um, so the way in which we've seen an immediate impact is on reformulation of the sugary drinks. Uh, so just to share with you some of the statistics, LucasAid, um, which when I was a child, certainly uh, all the ads were if children were sick, uh, you would see an ad of, you know, give a child a little sip of LucasAid and they'd be jumping up and down and jumping out of the bed. Um, there were 13 grams of sugar per 100 mils in LucasAid, and they immediately reduced their sugar content down to four and a half grams per 100 mil. So a huge reduction. Uh, Ribena also had 10 grams per 100 mil of sugar, and they likewise reduced down to 4.5 grams. Um, uh, Pepsi set themselves a target to gradually reduce uh, from 11 grams per 100 mil down by 20 uh, percent by 2020. So we have seen a change in terms of food reformulation. Um, and that also brings us on to an amazing collaboration that currently exists between the Department of Health and the Food Safety Authority of Ireland, um, who have created the Food uh, Reformulation Task Force. Uh, they will be reporting in 2025, but um, I would uh, suggest Yes, that our listeners who are tuned in today uh, to check out the website uh, because they are producing reports on a regular basis and um, ultimately their objective is not only to reduce the sugar but also foods that are high in fat and high in salt um, so that we can improve our Irish diet. So it, this is just incredible Geraldine because your work is so far-reaching but it, and, and our audience have picked up on that. I mean, you know, some of our audience are suggesting that the work that you're doing in burnout for healthcare workers could be applied to other sectors. We're not going to get time to talk about this. And they're looking at, you know, the health literacy work that you've done on cystic fibrosis, for example, the other health literacy work. And, um, you know, could you look at rare diseases? Because that as well, you know, not just health literacy for for the patients and their families, but also among health professionals, which is, you know, and, and just raising understanding. But I think we're, you know, we're, we're really running out of time. So what I'd, I'd love you to talk about is this idea of availability of, you know, in the last 60 seconds, availability of non-healthy versus healthy food in our supermarkets, because I think this is fascinating. And, and so you've got 60 seconds because then I'm going to have to wrap it up. Excellent. So we have an amazing PhD student um, that um, I'm co-supervising uh, with Professor Gibney of our UCD Food Institute. Um, and um, she has been um, going into three of our largest supermarkets in Ireland, um, measuring the shelf space devoted to healthy and unhealthy foods. And the framework that we're using is um, uh, built upon a validated instrument in Australia. Um, and also looking at the prominence in which, so for example, at the checkout, at the top of aisles of healthy and unhealthy foods. And you would be amazed that 70%, almost 70%, 68% of the foods in our supermarket is unhealthy. So again, this is going to be, an, this is incredible finding. It's the first time that the study and this data has been collected in Ireland and really calls upon um, our policymakers and regulation uh, to be put in place. Because again, thinking about teenagers at lunchtime, anywhere around campus, if you leave campus and go to any of our local supermarkets, there are lots of teenagers um, out on their lunch break and what do you see them buying unhealthy food well, and that's because 70 percent of what they're seeing is that uh, from from you know uh, we can't wait to see the I mean, yeah. this is unbelievable and actually, a lovely example, if I might just uh, share with you that I've noticed here in Boston, a, a particular supermarket um, that I go to, when you go into the entrance of the supermarket, you are bombarded with fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, um, and it's a huge section that's devoted to that. Whereas, you know, certainly when I was taking my children shopping when they were little, going into one of our um, uh, major supermarkets um, near campus, um, you'd walk into the beautiful bakery and you'd be hungry doing the shopping um, and you'd smell the beautiful bread and the beautiful, um, instead of the fresh fruit and vegetables. So, um, so I think there's something we can learn. Geraldine, your research is absolutely fascinating. We are completely, completely out of time. And I'm sincere apologies if I didn't get to your question, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to say the biggest and hugest thank you to Geraldine. Thank you so much. Such a fascinating discussion today, Geraldine. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And thanks to everybody for tuning in.
Yeah, and, and the same. Thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. Uh, join us next time on the next hit series, which you'll find on our website. So thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. We're getting so many thank yous, Jardine. It's wonderful. Thank you. Take care. Bye, Bye. everyone.